Okay, good morning, everybody. It looks like we're live, and I think we're live on all the different channels, too. Woo Yay, things are going to work. Yay. Welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida Extension in Hernando County, and my regular co-host, Lily Browning, has returned from vacation. I good back. morning, Lily. How are you? I, well, you know, I'm still in that kind of fuzzy, just back from vacation mode. But you I used actually, to sleep until about noon? I wasn't sleeping in that long. No. <laughs> Maybe 8.30 or so. <laughs> That's pretty late for me. Yeah. Um, except for the days when I wanted to do stuff outside, then I was up early. So. You better be up before dawn <laughs> and like dressed and outside at dawn if you want to get some time in, in your garden segue, or working outside now. That does segue into what I wanted to talk about today is this is this is Lily speaking and I'm telling all of you get your butt inside. <laughs> <laughs> Do not work outside today. <laughs> what are you talking about? It's beautiful outside. There's I don't see a cloud in the sky out my window. Okay, yeah. Enjoy it from your air-conditioned uh, perspective. It's supposed to get like a heat index of 112 or something like that today in some areas. Um, so, yeah, it's 10 o'clock now. So you're done for the day. Come in, watch us, <laughs> cool off, take a shower, <laughs> you know. My I start early and I figure by noon I'm done. I might go back out in the evening for an hour before dark because it's nice then also. But I, if I'm outside doing any work, it's usually from 7 to 10. That's it, 7 a.m. to 10. And then back again in the evening if I need to rewater things or whatever that I just planted. But um, no, I mean, there's really no reason. There are plenty of people out there, road workers, uh, house builders, things like that. Who have to be out in this and they have to take steps even you know the people the guys who mow your lawns or keep your landscape for you but our crowd our homeowner crowd uh, i would say 90 percent of whom are retired or <laughs> of retirement age my number my number one principle is take care of the gardener even though florida friendlies is right plant right place mine is take care of the gardener stay in today it's not worth it your yard will wait whatever needs yeah, it's not going anywhere <laughs> yes so. and with no rain unless you water things aren't really growing a whole lot either i'm having to go out there every single day and water specific things i don't water my lawn right. and it stopped growing it's starting to dry out now um, mine is actually looking pretty good. So does mine. My um, Bahia component in the front yard has really filled in again this year like it did last year. But I noticed it's getting really dried out now. But if we get regular rains to start oh, yeah. pretty soon, it'll look great. I know. I told everybody June 11th. And so I'm going to have to say, I didn't say where, did I? Uh -oh. Yeah, it's the 16th now. I'm a little bit behind. Yeah. Uh, if you're in downtown Brooksville, it's raining every day because, you know, they're a rainforest. <laughs> um, not officially, but <laughs> they are uh, the Oak Hammock. The area is east, as I said from before, um, when the rainy season tries to get started, it gets stalled at 75. It comes from the east and gets stalled on 75. I have no idea why 75 stops it. And then it gets past there, and every time I drive into downtown Brooksville, which is a lot lately, it's raining at least a little bit, or it has rained, um, but then it never makes it over like Sunshine Grove Road, which there, at least there is a geological feature of which I am aware, the Brooksville Ridge, which probably, you know, the winds come out west and east or like at an impasse there. Then it takes another couple of weeks for it to start to, you know, be across the state. So when it used to, I swear it used to go June and then dry up in September. 
lately the pattern is more July really starts the rainy season and it goes all the way through September doesn't really even stop till October so things change it varies I know years ago we had the really really bad um forest fires and just because of the weather pattern because I mean it's naturally pretty variable we got pretty much no rain until after 4th of July. Mm -hmm. Everybody had to cancel the fireworks for 4th of July. They were oh, afraid yeah. of starting fires. Because I had a brother-in-law who was a volunteer firefighter, and he was out for a couple weeks fighting forest fires. Of course, he absolutely loved it. Mm -hmm. But I know that um, there were roads out in the country that were shut down. I lived over in Volusia County at that time, so I'm not sure what impact it had right around here. But it over there, we everywhere. had a lot of roads shut down because, I mean, areas that hadn't burned for many years burned big, really big. Mm -hmm. So it's the benefit of controlled burns and planned fires, it keeps that fuel from piling up. And when we do have a really dry year, you don't have devastating fires like we did back then. So it happens every 20, 30 years. It happens. You know, there are... Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if there ever really is an average year. Seems like there used to be. <laughs> but yeah. lately, in the past 10 years, you can't really, it's just not as predictable as it used to be. We, oh, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow will be um, Friday. For, you know, yes, this June 17th. Let me see. What's 2022 minus 1978? <laughs> you get my calculator to see for sure. Somebody's going to answer us real quick. 44. 44 years that I have lived in Florida. Oh, okay. <laughs> you say you haven't worked for the county for that long. No. <laughs> I was 11 when we moved here. There you go, everyone. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> and um, what made me think of it is I had a sister already living here, an older sister. And, you know, of course, no cell phones then, but we had stopped in on the way. So we called her from that, you know, <laughs> that phone in the hotel. And my mother said about what time we expected to be in Brooksville. It was around four. We expected to be there. And my sister said, OK, it'll be raining. And we're like, what? <laughs> And she was absolutely right. Of course, then being newbies, my mother had to pull over <laughs> because it was raining so hard. Right at the hilltop in Brooksville, you know where that is? <laughs> anyway, that's where we had to pull over and wait uh, for the rain to stop. So it's not quite as predictable as it was anymore. So... You there, Bill, or are you frozen up? <laughs> I think we have Bill frozen in a very nice pose there, but <laughs> let's try him and bring him back. Uh-oh. He disappeared. <laughs> I guess it's just me. I guess Bill, you know, got tired of my reminiscing, so... Or it could be that he is having technical trouble uh, last week when I was not working, but I was actually, I tried to get on and watch like you guys do. And I thought I just didn't know how to do it from that end. But apparently it was, a, there was a Facebook page not operating properly. So yeah, he did freeze or uh, Cindy or he, burned up in the heat. No, I think what he's doing is he's trying to figure out the technical error as to why it might not be playing on a, some Facebook page or some other format. So while he disappeared and abandoned me here, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. Um, Kendra says she agrees. Rainfall was like clockwork years ago. It really was. Um, like I said, my sister told us it would be raining at four o'clock on June 17th when we arrived in Brooksville in 1978. And you could have said that even 10, 12 years ago, too. And as I said, it, it, the pattern seems to have shifted. It was always raining June and would really, really dry up in September. 
and now we get rain all through September. We get like our most um, active hurricane season seems to be through September. So it's just different. I'm not a meteorologist or a climatologist, but there must be, you know, something has shifted. Um, and it could, you know, probably perfectly natural, just the way, you know, things um, have progressed over the years. Nothing is as predictable as it used to be. I think that explains our whole lives now. Nothing is predictable as it used to be. Carol said she had wondered what happened last week. She had the same issue I did. I thought I just didn't know how to do it. <laughs> like, how do these people watch us? I can't even get on, but apparently there, there was an issue, a technical issue. Kim grew up in Dade City in the 70s. And um, yeah, every day at 3 p.m., it would rain for 15 minutes. Dr. Lester is telling me that their internet has gone out. <laughs> So, um, hopefully it'll come back soon. I'm not sure if he had anything uh, particular he wanted to cover today. Jenny was born here. Um, we knew we had to get our clothes washed and hung out on the line. Absolutely. We made sure to get the clothes off the line by 3 o'clock. It was very predictable. That is absolutely right. Because back then... Um, it was not unusual to not even own a dryer. I mean, I don't think I owned a dryer until I asked for one um, when I had a baby about to come and I just thought life would be easier that way. But I, um, so we would wash the clothes in the washer, which was probably out in a shed. It was not in the house with us. We had to go through the yard into a shed <laughs> to wash our clothes. And I'm talking about the 1980s, the 70s and 80s here, not like the 1880s. And then, and this is what the teenagers did. It was all, seemed to always be our job. And then we would go and hang them on the line and then have to get them back down before three o'clock. If we didn't, they just went through another rinse cycle. So, um, and you hoped they would dry out sometime in the near future before, you know, the next day's rain came along. But now that I think about that, yeah, that was very prevalent. And all of my friends, when I was a teenager, seemed like we were all in charge of the laundry. So we would go visit each other and, and help each other <laughs> hang out laundry on the line. I'm so wimpy now. I really don't think, I, I, I actually enjoy hanging clothes on a line. I find it like peaceful and comforting to do so. But... Unfortunately, I now have so many allergies. <laughs> I can't leave like the clothes hanging out there without bringing the allergens in and causing problems for me later. So, as I was mentioning, it is very, very, very hot today. So if you're just joining, I think he's trying to return. You came back. No, you're gone. <laughs> I'm just joining also. Yes, yeah. everybody's internet went out here at the office, so. <laughs> hey. You know what we were talking about? Um, the days of old in Florida. Mm -hmm. and those who have been here a long time, those who were born here. And oh, I think uh, and nearly everyone hung their clothes on the line. And I'm talking about the 1980s, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, that was the job of teenagers is we would. We had one washing machine, you know, that was in a shed. We had to leave the house, go through the yard <laughs> to get to the shed. No Were the dryer. chickens in there also? Yeah, sometimes. Okay. The chickens, the chickens would be in a different <laughs> place in the yard. And um, it was always a teenager's job for some reason to have to do the laundry. So when we would go to each other's houses, we would help each other hang clothes on the line. But you had to get them back off by 3 o'clock or they were going to get rained on. That, that was the whole point. Yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And just how things are not quite as predictable now. Is it maybe, maybe they were, maybe we just, we look back nostalgically and think they were more predictable. They were a combination. Also, it's, those times, um, and I just saw some, you know, a person my age I went to school with complain on Facebook about the state of her feet. 
<laughs> and they're not in great shape now because none of us wore shoes <laughs> when we were doing all that. <laughs> well, when I was a kid, we ran around with no shoes all the time also. Mm -hmm. Dangerous where you were, though, because the bees um, like the clover in the grass. Yeah, because half your lawn all summer long was clover. I mean, there were bees and mm -hmm. bumblebees and wasps all over. So, yeah. I haven't done any specific on plant questions while you were gone. Okay. I see we got a couple of mosquito comments. Yes. Um, and yeah, I was going to mention, uh, was it Lee? Um, yeah, been raining every day in Broward. That's kind of, it just really seems to start from the east. It must come off the Atlantic. And then eventually the Gulf kind of catches up, throwing the same kind of breezes. And then when it gets to a certain um temperature i heard recently it's never been above 100 in tampa ever really? in written records it might feel like it. it feels like temperature probably is because of them being on the water but also it only can get so hot and then it explodes into a rain shower <laughs> so that's yeah, what happens yeah. um here in florida that's like down in the keys there's always a breeze so it can get it'll get hot but there's always a breeze. Mm -hmm. There's and usually, if you look, almost always a breeze here. Um, there is. Well, I've noticed the Spring Hill, especially late in the day, it gets really breezy almost every day. Even if there's no clouds, no rain nearby, no reason for it to be windy, it's still pretty windy. My daughter moved to Savannah um, years ago. Um, and she told me, oh, my gosh, I thought it would be the same. I did not know that Florida has a breeze all the time. <laughs> Savannah does not. So. Yeah, I mean, you don't realize that up north, there's a lot of states where it gets very hot in July and August. Maryland would be 105 degrees with an air pollution alert. I have nearly August. died in, <clears throat> in Washington, D.C., so of the heat trying to walk around in July and it's in that bowl. Oh, that was horrible. I was literally pouring water on my head. <laughs> you you have to build up to it. I mean, you can get used to the heat, but if you're not used to the heat, you can't just, you know, stroll outside at high noon at 95 degrees out and go for more than five minutes. So. We're going to have this argument again. Some of us. <laughs> Let's talk about no, 40, 40 My wife goes out there in, in the middle of the day. It's 95 degrees, and she wants to start pressure washing out around the pool at like 1 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. I'm like, honey, you're going to pass out. It's really hot. I'm not going to help because it's too hot right now. We should have been out there doing that at 7 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. After 5 or 10 minutes, she's like, I feel sick. I, said, I told you. <laughs> It is, it, and she's a native mm -hmm. Floridian. Which you have yeah. to be used to it, because I used to work outdoors, and if you got used to it, you can handle a lot, but you have to get used to it, and you have to be yeah. smart, too. Lots of water, not soda, oh, not milkshakes and stuff like that. Oh, that'll not. make you, that'll make you ill. Energy yeah. drinks, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I see the construction people uh, on roofs and everything. I, I don't know how they handle it. But Practice. I'm with Monique. <laughs> no getting used to this heat. You can get used to it, but it takes practice and you have to be intentional about it. Or you could stay inside during the heat of the day, plan on doing your outdoor work for a couple hours very early in the morning mm -hmm. and Late in the day, like the last hour or so before it gets dark, mm -hmm. it can be very nice outside, especially if the breeze picks up. It's very yeah. nice. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned that before, and then I mm -hmm. told you I just happened to be outside, like right, right at dusk, and I was like, "Oh, that's right. There is this nice breeze out here." Although yesterday, right before dark, I noticed it. I think it was like eighty-eight degrees outside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, although I, I had to go outside and water everything. It did not feel bad, but it wasn't cool. 
and it wasn't particularly greasy. It was warm and it was dry. I had, I had um, gotten some new plantings. I got a fakahatchee, a big bunch of fakahatchee grass mm -hmm. from a mutual friend of ours. I was at her house at eight o'clock in the morning <laughs> to dig that up. And um, then I took it home and I broke it up and made like 16 different little Fakahatchee grasses out of it. So that needs mm -hmm. watered to see if that's going to, you know, take. And it's in the very, very back of my, of my yard. My point is I'm trying to make more, as much of a buffer as I can in those areas where I'm expecting more development <laughs> behind me. And, and anyway, so I'm back there watering and then I got in my pool and I don't know, I just felt something, you know, on my back and it wouldn't, it wouldn't brush off and I ended up like scratching it off with my fingernail and pulled it around and it was a tick. <laughs> 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 Obviously not very attached, mm -hmm. but I must have got it from being out in our back 40 or something. So that's something else you need to be careful of out there. So. Ticks and mosquitoes and hey, we have a plant related question because after all this is the virtual plant clinic i see it right up at the very top of the screen there so jenny says her daughter's hibiscus plant was covered in these shiny black bubbles she pulled one or two off the stem and it didn't have legs just like little black bubbles uh just covered the whole branch I found out it is called black scale. That would have been my guess from the, the description here. I've never heard them described as bubbles. That's pretty interesting. <laughs> it looks like a bubble. Yeah, it does. And they sprayed it with soapy water and cut the worst branches off and burned them. I've never seen that before. Okay. So yes, I would have guessed from the description that was some kind of scale because scales when they're first born their first instar, first stage, when they're really tiny, they have legs and they crawl around. And they find a spot on your plant, on the stem or a leaf, usually a stem, and they stop and they molt and they never move again. They don't crawl, they don't run around, they don't fly, they sit there. And they poke into your plant stem and suck the juices out and damage the plant that way. So scales, you're ne almost never going to see them actually moving around. They're like little bumps that sit there. Now, plants can have little bumps on the stems. They have little bumps on the leaves. They have little bumps for other reasons. And so it's a little hard to tell, is this a scale? Is it part of the stem? Some plant stems naturally have little bumps on them. And, yeah. you know, a little confusing. Do I have scale? Do I not have scale? You could take a pocket knife. And if you can plink it off, I'm not sure if that's the technical term, but you know, you get the idea. You take the pocket knife Great. and plink it off, Great. it's a scale. If yeah, it doesn't if it gives you off, resistance, like mushy resistance, then it's still alive. Yeah, if it doesn't plink off, it's part of the stem. If you've already sprayed it they, and, they, and they're dead, they don't move. It's kind of, well, how do I tell if it's dead or alive? If you take the pocket knife and push on it and it crunches, it's dead. If it squishes, it's alive. I like the pocket knife idea. I have only mm -hmm. ever heard fingernail. So. You can use a fingernail, but a, a pocket knife works better. It's sharper. Yeah, yeah. and it's less gross. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, soapy water, dishwashing liquid is not the best thing to treat insects with on your plants because nobody had, they don't make uh, dish soap. soap anymore. It's all dish detergent. It could all be very, very harsh on your plants and your plants leaves. So even though it kind of sort of works, it's definitely not the best. Yeah. You want to, we used to be able to get in the days when we had washing machines and sheds, we used to be able to get with the chickens, um, with the chickens. Uh -huh. pink dish liquid, Remember that yellow dish liquid would do nothing for your dishes. My sister and I would constantly like fluff up the water to try and create a bubble. Yeah, it didn't make bubbles very well. No, but that is what you are looking for in, you know, your soapy uh, 
you know, plant or mm -hmm. what helps with scale and things, ivory soap, you know, just plain soap, anything like Dawn or really even any of the generics now have uh, degreasers and detergent in it, which are um, harsh on your plants. So if you can find something that's just soap, you're doing well. But probably the easiest thing to do would be to go buy our already commercially, you know, created safer soap type product, you know, horticultural soap, horticultural soap and oil. Be really careful with anything, though, with oil. Don't do it at noon <laughs> unless you want to fry your plants. <laughs> you must be finding a publication. Yes, I am. I'm working on that. Okay. And when you, yeah, you want to be careful. Um, as he said, it sort of worked and you can get all kinds of information, whether correct or not, um, on the internet. So I believe in your office, you even have a, um, did you freeze up again? I think he did. <laughs> the extension office has um, a homemade recipe. I believe you can ask them about. But like we said, it has to make sure that it's really soap. Um, or there he's, if he ever returns again, uh, it's going to find uh, a publication for you. Or you can go to your big box store. Safer Soap, I believe, is the brand name. Are you going to join us again now? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Our, our internet is obviously not well. <laughs> It's a good thing I'm here today. <laughs> yes, it is. And it's a good thing that I gave you uh, uh, permissions and everything. So you can come on here and run it yourself if you need to. <laughs> I just remove you when you <laughs> freeze up and figure um, you'll be back. <laughs> you know, so, of course, when I, was, when I was trying to share that link to UF publication on soaps, of course, that's when the Internet crashed. Mm hmm but let me go ahead and try that again. And this is a publication that was co-written co or co-written by our friend Matt Borden. And it's all about using different soaps for pest control on your plants. Dish soap is dish detergent and definitely not the best. Safer soap or insecticidal soap is a different, it's different chemically and it's much safer on plants. I was mentioning um, horticultural oils people use that a lot too but that yeah, is, that is really the best for scales but can't use it during the heat of summer because it'll there fry your plants there we go um you had a question up top how many years before a where did you go how many years oh. before a canistole tree fruits she has a four i don't know <laughs> that I is a tropical that fruit that i am not very familiar with Okay. But okay. we'll look it up. And Lee is asking, is um, pure Castile cast soap okay? As long as it's pure soap, it should be okay. But you still only want, you know, a small amount. And that publication that he gives you, I think, does it basically give you the recipe, Bill? Uh, no, I think in the publication it recommends to purchase already made insect oh, okay. model soap. All right. Because that's made from potassium salts of fatty acids, which is totally different from what you're using to clean your pots and pans with. Mm -hmm. And it, it's very effective on insects. We're not going to get too deep into exactly how it controls them, but it does. It does a very good job and it's safe to use on your plants. Well, the horticultural it's oils to burn your leaves and burn your plants. The horticultural oils because um, insects have what are they oracles? Is that what it's called? Um, little breathing holes like all over them, and that clogs it up. Apparently, it clogs Dr. Lester up too. We must have used I'm just gonna pop on and off, I guess. So every time I try to post something on here is when yeah. I crash. So don't do that. <laughs> okay. 
I found a publication on Canistel. Okay, let's see if I can screen share this real quick. We're gonna, you're gonna blow everything up. I probably will. <laughs> da, 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 da. There we go. That is a uh, Canistel. And common names are yellow sapote. I'm, I'm familiar with the other black sapote, which looks just like this, but the fruits are darker colored. Wow. Oh, it's related to mames, one of my favorites. And it's native to southern Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, and El Salvador. So, Lily, is our winter weather here in central Florida like it is there? No, it is not. Okay, but I think you good. were, um, the question, who did it come from? Lee is in Broward County, so she's okay with this. Yes, it will grow down there. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, it looks like it's, it, it's cold tolerant, definitely down to like freezing. Below that, all bets are off and it may kill your tree. <laughs> I think my opinion now is with it is getting warmer. Um, so if you're going to experiment, number one, know that you're experimenting and you could lose. But if you're going to experiment, you know, then go ahead and try some of these tropical things with the knowledge it could be a losing experiment. So you don't want to spend a thousand dollars, you know, on, you know, tropical fruits or something that you may or may not be able to have here. But if someone gives you one or you can find things fairly cheap, you know, why not go ahead and try it? But Yeah, I'm going to um, either order or go and purchase a mango tree and try and grow one. Mm-hmm. I have a whole bunch of um, uh, yellow dragon fruit now that has to go on the ground. Having said that, I mean, I still had, you know, pretty much many, many things, and I don't have any tropical fruits or anything, but many things in my yard grows to the ground last winter. And that is very typical, and that is, you know, that's going to happen, but they came back. What is, what is not happening, what hasn't happened in a long time, is things freezing dead 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 never to return <laughs> yeah we're, we're more of just the uh you know the topical foliage gets frozen but the roots don't and they come back so it happens the um the the best indicator plant near where i live is the tea or thai plant the kind of reddish plants mm -hmm. every winter they get hammered they're, oh, they're going to get some freeze damage. Sure. But it kind of, you could tell, are they just a little bit damaged or are they frozen down to the ground? And if you completely trim them back, nine times out of ten, they're going to grow back. Mm -hmm. If they don't, then it was a pretty serious winter. Right. We, we, if it was not unusual 15 years ago to have winter so harsh <sighs> that it would literally kill your St. Augustine lawn. I've never seen that. Yeah, we we used to see it, but it hasn't occurred in quite some time. And people come here and they think something's wrong with their lawn because it's straw colored in the winter, and that's just normal. That's winter dormancy. So, unless you artificially try to keep it um, on life support by watering it all winter long. Yeah. We've been getting a lot of long questions. I covered that last week. Oh, did you? Yeah, long question. Uh, that's long. As you can probably tell, long questions are not my favorite topic. Yeah, it is kind of. Um, lawns are interesting because I don't think they're ever going to go completely away. I think our obsession with having the perfect lawn is what's going to go away. Do you really see Gen Z caring as much as we do about lawns? No, <laughs> not really. Yes. I mean, I think there are times when 
because of lifestyles or whatever, all the people want is to have something green and mowable and go about their life, and that's fine. But I think they're going to, you know, not bow to the pressure of the perfect weed-free, bug-free lawn. But Sam has a question about his zucchini. Okay, let's go on to a, a vegetable question here. Bassem says, my zucchini vine growing very healthy, but never fruits. It's too hot. You have, <laughs> a couple things here. You have to be patient because when any kind of squash grows and it starts to get flowers on it, the first flowers are always male. And then eventually you get female flowers and that's what you're going to get the zucchini fruit off of. So if your plant's healthy and flowering, just be patient and you should be getting some female flowers soon and if they get pollinated thoroughly and if you don't end up with an insect problem and if you don't end up with 10 different fungal diseases on your plant you'll get zucchini but it's tough and all depending on exactly where you live we're getting into the time of year where tomatoes any kind of squash zucchini yellow squash pumpkins watermelons it's it's just about the end of their spring season. And every time you say that to someone, they argue with you. They don't want to hear sure. that. And there's always an exception to that, but very, very few exceptions. And mm -hmm. for anybody who belongs to any Facebook gardening groups, go on, go on your Facebook feed and go in there. And all you're going to see is one picture after another of a cucumber plant, zucchini plant, tomato plant. They look terrible. The leaves are black. They got white splotches. They're falling off. What, you know, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? It's after June 15th by one day. <laughs> and basically the end in central Florida, the end of the season for those things is June 15th. After that, you may still get some more fruit off of it. You won't much longer after it. Soon it's going to be so hot where you won't, your tomato plant won't set tomatoes. Right. And any cucumbers or zucchini or yellow squash you get will be filled with caterpillars. So you might get cucumbers, but you're going to get extra protein in the cucumbers you probably don't really want. And there's no way, real way to avoid that. Because here, you don't grow those things this time of year. Up north, you do, but not mm -hmm. down here. So people need to realize that. Jenny has an avocado tree question. Yes, Jenny has an avocado tree that was grown from a seed. I've had it in a pot under my screen room by the pool. It has never bloomed. I do have to keep it cut back, and I've read that the fruit it made on old growth, that may be why. But I'm afraid it will die if I plant it out in the yard. I live near 50 in Mariner. Is there any way I could plant it out in the yard without cold killing it? There's no promise of that. There's, there's no guarantee. Technically, we're too far north and a bit too cold for avocados. There's a few varieties that take cold better, but that only applies to like older, mature trees. There are a few people here who successfully get avocados. I've seen some pictures, but not many. So it's a tough one. It's possible, but it's tough. And if you grow... Kind of a warm area where she is because of all the development around there you know there's a whole lot of um, buildings <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, businesses and things like that so it may actually be the degree or two warmer that you need on a you know night that we have a freeze just depends on your microclimate as well but an avocado grown from a pit or a seed takes a number of years before it, it gets out of its juvenile period and changes internally and biochemically where it can flower and set fruit and that'll take five to ten years all depending uh so jenny if you live in miami you can throw an avocado pit on the ground and you'll have a tr producing tree in a few years because in miami avocados grow pretty much year round except for i don't know maybe a few weeks in the winter mm -hmm. um here they stop growing for months every year, so it's going to take longer. So it could take technically 10 years for that tree to be old enough where it can flower and fruit. And then you have to worry about it not getting cold damaged 
and being knocked back where it has to grow back to get to where it was, gets knocked back, and you never get further forward. So we're technically just a bit outside of avocado world, although I guarantee you there's, how many, we have 14 people on here right now. Mm -hmm. There's probably one person on here that is successfully growing avocados. Or they have a friend in Newport Ritchie. <laughs> yeah. Everyone has a friend in Newport Ritchie where they can grow these things just that little bit further south from yep. Maryland. Yep. You know, you got a Newport Ritchie, that 20 miles or whatever it is, plus they're on the water there. They you know, get away with a lot more tropicals than we can. They grow mangoes down in Tarpon Springs, yep. which isn't far away. Because mm -hmm. I got an email from somebody and him and his friends all grow mangoes down there. And all of them are having a really bad harvest this year. And I thought, oh. So I forwarded it to um, our tropical fruit agent in Miami, Jeff Wasluski, who helped to co-teach a class with me recently. And he said it's a problem all over Florida. We got late winter cold and dry weather and windy weather. And everybody all over Florida is having a kind of bad mango harvest this year. So before you ask if you're having problems with your mangoes, that's why it's a bad year for everybody. But yeah, tarpon is, well, how long does it take me to get there? An hour? An you hour south of here? Yeah. You grow mangoes here? Yeah. Dicey. Dicey at best. Mm -hmm. So I'm jealous. Yes. <laughs> well, you got to move further south. Yeah. I wish I could grow mangoes and raspberries here. Oh, Jenny's avocado tree is about 10 years old. Oh. It will start to bloom when it's ready. You <laughs> need to fertilize it with a um, a fruit tree fertilizer, so not lawn fertilizer. Lawn fertilizer has way too That's much nitrogen. Something nitrogen. with a higher middle number yeah, for the, the fruiting and the bloom, blooming, yes. Yeah, and you can find that in a small bag at Lawn and Garden Centers. It's fruit tree fertilizer for avocados, mangoes, variety of other fruit trees. Alicia's asking about her okra. And that is something you can grow right now. Uh-oh. Okay, let, let, you know, let's, let's go up here a little bit. Alicia likes na natural. Yes, I think she's responding to um, me saying that um, we don't see lawns um uh being that much as prevalent in the future i mean at least not our obsession with the perfect lawn i think lawns are going to be around because they are really the easiest thing to care for sometimes and people want that open space um but we'll see if we can get bill back <laughs> um yeah, we're not going to be obsessed with the perfect of it. Okay, are you well, back? This, this recording is going to be a hot mess, I tell you. <laughs> okay, your tomato bush died. Never had, had that happen before because it's hot. You're right, it's getting too hot. That is normal here. If you live, so Alicia, if you live in Central Florida, Hernando County or anywhere a bit north or a bit south of that, that's normal. Um, it gets too hot. And it gets too hot at night. And once we start to get the rains, it gets wet late in the day. Uh, your garden stays wet all night. It gets very humid. <laughs> How about we just do this next week and I'll just do it from home and I'll just be like be in my pajamas with my feet up, you know, nice and comfy. Uh, the phone can ring and the internet can drop and but Alicia's tomato looks like it's died. That's totally normal in Central Florida when we get to the middle of June. She's After that, time. between the heat, the humidity, high temperatures during the day and at night, and the wetness, the disease pressure, the insects, and everything is going to overwhelm your tomatoes. And if you try fixing that with extra water or extra fertilizer, or insecticide where you're spraying because you don't, I must, there must be a bug, I don't know what it is, but I'm gonna spray anyway. What you're doing is you're just spending a lot of money and putting a lot of chemicals in the environment and you're not gonna stop the inevitable. I'm sorry, but your, your spring tomatoes 
will perish very soon. It's best to plan on planting them again in the fall. I'm going to be starting tomatoes. I think technically you're supposed to do it mid-July. Start them from seed, get them in little pots, put them in partial shade outside, maybe screening or whatever. Don't put them out in the full sun all day. They're going to burn up when they're real tiny. Yeah, Raise tomato transplants. So by middle of August or end of August, you can put them back out in the garden and have a fall crop. Because then the days are getting shorter, the sun's less intense, and that works. Alicia's in Orange County, which would be pretty much identical yeah. to here, um, to Hernando, except I would say it's um, warmer, a little bit warmer, because you are inland. You're not a coastal county like we are. So you have even more heat. Also, you're a lot more uh, density of um, population and, again, you know, the city type situation. So you're probably a few degrees warmer, but otherwise pretty much identical to here. She has a question. It's, it's about not okra. breezy every afternoon like it is at my house. Yes. And her okra is also not producing well. First time ever. What is going on with the crops this year? Over the past year, my garden has been bad. Okra, I planted okra, and I'm growing it in containers, and it's coming up, and looks good. Boy, it is hard to keep it watered. Okra is a water hog. Growing containers dry out pretty quickly. If I don't water it shortly after I get home every day, I'm going to have serious problems with it. So definitely crossing my fingers, waiting for rain. Mm. Okra should do well this year. You have to water it until it starts to rain. So, Alicia, if you're growing okra in the ground, in your garden, there's a pest out there that really, really likes okra. Okra is its favorite thing to feed on, and those are nematodes. Root not nematodes. In containers. Hers are in containers. Yes, so I don't have that problem because mine are in containers, but the containers dry out really fast, so it's kind of, you know, pluses and minuses. Mm -hmm. So if anybody's growing okra in the ground and you have root knot nematodes, they will eat up the roots. And if your plants look really bad and fall over and die, gently dig one up. And if you look at it and it kind of looks like this stem with almost no roots or the roots are black or very, very short, you have nematodes and you're going to have a really tough time growing okra in the soil. There's very, very few ways to control nematodes. You could try soil solarization in the heat of summer. That helps. There's a few products out there now, and there's at least one. I'll, I'll pull up some information about it and share it next week. I'm going to purchase some and try it. A nematicide? Yes, it is a nematicide for homeowners that is produced from an oil made from a tree. Hmm. So it's technically organic. Certified organic, Omri certified, and I have no idea how well it works. So I'm probably going to get some and use it in my garden this fall. Right now, I don't have a whole lot growing in it. But when I do, I have root nut nematodes. I'm going to try this stuff, and I'm going to see if it makes a difference. Okay. So Alicia, for right now, the one main pest of okra is nematodes. And if you have nematodes, I had... Both myself and Dr. Strickland took uh, nematology at the University of Florida, and we both had the same professor, Dr. Dixon, and I, he's probably retired now. I'm not positive. I think he is. Yeah. He said, "Root knot nematodes love okra. They would dig a, they would bury under I-75 to get to an okra plant." Yeah. <laughs> so, that's something I've never forgotten. Keep that in mind. <laughs> so, I guess. Where you live in Orange County, a uh, root knot nematode would dig under I-4 to get to I was going to say that, yes. Um, so. And um, Alicia, if you've never been to the Orange County Extension Office, you can do yourself a favor and go there. They have an amazing demo, demo garden. Don't go this afternoon. It's too hot this afternoon. <laughs> but go sometime when the weather's nice and talk to Tia, right, Bill? Sure. Tia is the Florida Friendly Landscape. Um, they have a number of agents down there. They have they have a urban hort and master gardener coordinator. They have a separate urban hort person. 
Uh, Tia is the Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator. And she knows a lot about vegetables. She's a FFL person who happens to know vegetables. Me, um, I just concentrate on the, the pollinators and the water saving and all of that and let Bill answer the vegetable questions. But she has a lot of prior knowledge to it. We do have a crepe myrtle question up there, too. Yes, we do. Yeah. Jerry says, why is my crepe myrtle leaves turning red and yellow? That Jim, normally happens in the winter. Um, is it on your irrigation system? Is that crepe myrtle getting watered as often as your lawn is? That might be um, an issue with it. You know, it doesn't want, it might be, maybe it's getting overwatered. What do you think, Bill? That could be because crepe myrtles are very drought tolerant. Yeah which means that it needs water but not a lot so if you're running your irrigation because things have been really dry your lawn's really dry uh i have no, have no idea what county you live in we have no idea how often you're running your sprinklers i talked to people i spoke with a gentleman once before i had to go look at his irrigation and they are in the neighborhood one of the very few that has reclaimed water here in hernando mm -hmm. county mm -hmm. i said how often do you water your lawn he said every day so not trying to get anybody into trouble. I don't even, I couldn't find his house. It was a couple of years ago. I don't remember where his house was or his name, but some people water a lot. Crepe myrtles, if you water them way too much, they don't like that. No, but if it's way, if it's out by the road and it's bone dry and it hasn't rained in a month or so, it doesn't like that a whole lot either. So you need to get the, the watering. My guess is it's either too much water or maybe too little water. Yeah, and it does. I mean, that's its natural sentencing or going down, not really in the fall, but in the winter, it, you know, turns. Sometimes you'll get really beautiful, like, fall-like colors from a crepe myrtle in, like, yeah. December. <laughs> but it shouldn't be doing that now. It should be really, mine is blooming like I've never seen it. <laughs> you know, it's just as happy as can be. My neighbor's is one of the white ones, the old-fashioned Natchez, and they seem like they've always been first to bloom. He's got like one flower <laughs> trying to start to bloom, whereas my, uh, that really, really, the pink one, he's just covered in flowers. But I don't water. He does. Maybe that's a difference. Polk County. Okay. Yes, he's in Polk County. Polk County. And um, I'm pulling up information on that nematode control. Um, well, for the crepe myrtle, though, I think Polk County has been getting some pop-up flash um, thunderstorms and stuff. So maybe if it's getting that as well as if you happen to have on your automatic irrigation system, maybe that it's too much for it. So. And... With a crepe myrtle, you should go out there and check it for aphids. Go and turn the leaves over, and aphids are very small. You're probably going to need a hand lens or magnifying glass. It's normal for a crepe myrtle to have some aphids on it, and some aphids are not going to do a whole lot of damage. Crepe myrtles are generally tough as nails. It's one of those really yeah. tough yeah. plants. Mm -hmm. But if you have huge numbers of aphids, Uh-oh, he froze up again. Just when we were going to hear the, the answer to the huge number of aphids, <laughs> what you should do, and I'm sure he was going to recommend again that um, safer soap or even horticultural uh, soap and oil. Again, be very, 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 very careful with an oil product in our heat. Um, great modules are pretty rough. Are you back? <laughs> yes, for a moment, for a quick moment. We probably need to wrap it up for today anyway. But well, but tell us, you left us with a with a cliffhanger. <laughs> okay, well, the answer that you've all been waiting for is with crepe myrtles, if you have a huge infestation of aphids, you're probably going to have to spray with insecticidal soap once or maybe twice to knock the number down. But if you turn over leaves and you see a few aphids, don't go into a panic. Your crepe myrtle can handle a few aphids. If you see ladybugs, you probably don't even need to spray. 
There's lots of other beneficial insects out there that like to eat aphids. Yes. So aphids usually aren't bad enough on crepe myrtles where you have to take action, but sometimes they are. It's possible. Jerry has no irrigation on his crepe myrtle. What I would suggest right now is if you can get uh, a good picture of the whole tree and then some close-ups of some of the leaves, and send them to W. Lester <laughs> at ufl.edu. Um, we might be able to explore this further. So. Okay, now let me try to screen share something really, really quick here. Oh no, he's going to nematode control. Dun dun dun! It's going to crash. <laughs> There we go, and I don't know how large that is or how well you can see it. Yeah, you can see it. It is, and we're, we're not promoting or advocating any brand in particular, but this is made by Monterey, and it's nematode control. And it is made from an oil that comes from a bark of a tree. And you need to follow the directions on this. And I don't know how effective it is, but I'm going to try it myself. So this is a, a, it's organic. You can see in the center of the label where it says OMRI. That's the Organic Materials Research Institute. So it's OMRI certified, so it's organic. Don't drink it. Don't get it all over yourself. Read the directions and be very, very careful using it. But this, you mix it up and you water it in your plants. And it helps to reduce the number of nematodes and helps to control them. So give it a try. Um, we can all, I guess we can all figure out whether it works or not. Okay. And someone's asking and if there's um, a specialist, a mango specialist. Do we have a mango specialist in Central Florida? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Nobody at the university, or fruit props in general, uh, tropical fruit props. Let me think. Um, well, no, we do not have a specialized agent that handles specifically mangoes. Mangoes are more of a South Florida right. thing. I could always do a class on it. <laughs> I'll mark that down. Mangoes. So, yeah, we'll have a class on mangoes. I'll get a speaker in. Um, and we'll do that. Uh, we've been having a number of uh, regular classes on different oh, things that you can grow and produce at home to make yourself more sustainable and um, food secure. Mm -hmm. <gasps> okay. We have a fan. Yay. Alicia loves <laughs> it at the virtual plant clinic. So, Alicia, if you ever have to deal with anybody with Orange County Extension or if you contact Tia, be sure to tell her that you follow us online. Yes. That's who you should invite to come. She hasn't been here in quite some time. Yeah. Yeah. No, I need to invite her for the plant clinic. She did a class on uh, pineapples. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll, I will probably start with asking her to do mangoes, too. So, And it was Tammy that wants to learn about mangoes. Okay. Great. And somebody wants to learn about ginger and turmeric. You, you have know, that coming up. as a matter of fact, we have that scheduling coming up in just a few weeks. Yes, so, we yeah, let, let me scroll our web page here. If you go to Hernando Extension, all one word, dot com, you're going to see a list of all of our upcoming classes. And one of them coming up in just a few weeks is on edible ginger and turmeric. And there is a charge for this class, but the class part is going to be online uh, through Zoom, and we record it. So if you're if you're working that day or can't make it live, we send you a link to the recording so you can watch it once or twice or ten times, whatever you want to do. And then you're going to be able to come by either our office or the nursery and pick up two edible ginger plants and two turmeric plants. So you get four plants with this class. Very good. Four plants. Okay. And they're, they're super easy to grow. Ginger and turmeric does not take a lot of extra care. 
can't think of any major problems it has. And it, it's a perennial, so it's going to die, freeze back and die and disappear in the winter and come back in the spring, just like caladiums and a lot of other bulbs do. And you're going to be able to dig them up and have your own fresh-grown ginger roots or turmeric roots, both of which are very tasty. They're good and good for you. Yes, they are. Uh, Alicia wants to talk about vermicomposting. So, I don't know. Yeah, but I've been putting on that for a while. Yeah. <laughs> and I know who to who can do that. You know a, a wormy person who can do that? Somebody I went to school with, I can't remember her name off the top of my head. She's with Leon County Extension. Ooh, so Buddy can go get her and have her do it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> And see, Alicia's growing turmeric and ginger. It's rewarding. It's easy. It's one of those things that if you just get a bunch of plants and put them in, you can kind of set it and forget it. It doesn't take a lot of time and effort and expense. And they're they're very reliable also. Mm -hmm. We have a uh, friend who was a master gardener of Bills who decided to move to Madison County and how she has undertaken uh, containerized and raised beds, vegetables at the same time. <laughs> this is a very, very simple technique. She has those plastic lawn chairs and she puts a plastic bin on top of it, like you buy at the store, just, you know, a plastic uh -huh. bin. She puts holes at the bottom of the plastic bin. She said, didn't she say she was using uh, mulch and then some, you know, pretty good topsoil and so she's kind of creating compost in this process. She even puts a bucket under the, um, where the holes are to recycle the water again, <laughs> that goes through the holes. And it's very inexpensive that way. And it's very efficient. It's like the right height for her. So it seems to be working out great for her that way. There are- You know, that's all you need. Things. Yeah. Um, you know, there's like a billion different ways you can create containers, you know, to grow things in that, you know, whatever works for you. The Langle roots? Yes. Lily, do you know about them? I do not. <laughs> I don't know a whole lot about them either. But, uh -huh. but if you'd like to ask Lily any more questions, there is her email. And, yeah, uh, we will... I will do something with Galangal. And, you know, there are a lot of different South and Central American root crops. Um, Malanga, Boniado, they generally grow like potatoes, this type of potato or sweet potato. There's a lot of um, really minor crops that you can grow in your garden. And some of them are very, very easy to grow. And you can eat them which is always a bonus. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're going to try to um, cover all them bit by bit over time. If you need to shoot me an email, there is my email address. And before our internet crashes <laughs> once again, if anybody has any last minute questions, we're here to try to come up with an answer for you. The last day I was working, I was at the Hurricane Expo uh, here in Hernando County. It wasn't quite as bad. It was warm, but it wasn't anything like today or anything. But I did meet, you know, a few people. And it's funny that they would say, oh, you know, I listened to Lily Browning's classes or whatever. And they're looking right at me. <laughs> like, do I look that bad out here? <laughs> yeah. um, I'm not putting on the makeup or doing the hair to stand out in the heat. <laughs> they didn't realize till I started communicating with them that, oh, you are, you are Lily Browning. It's just kind of funny that way. <laughs> this is great, the kind of reach that you can get through social media or virtually, and we're very happy to do this. And it's very convenient because I do get emails from people who have, you know, garden questions and they say, I follow your plant clinic every week. I have to work, but I watch it in the evening. So we do get a lot of people who 
who aren't here live with us, but they watch it afterwards, and they go ahead and email their pictures and questions, and we're able to answer them that way. Um, Which is what I had to do with, with your class last week, because I couldn't get on live from Facebook, and I was like, do I just not yeah. know how to do this? I mean, everyone else seems to be able to know how to do it. But. No, because the plant clinic goes to our our office, our Hernando County Extension Facebook page, our private uh, Hernando County Extension uh, Gardeners group, and also to my YouTube. And it did not go to the Facebook page for some reason. And I wasn't sure how to rectify that. So it did yeah. go to the other two. I think I downloaded it and shared it back on facebook so yeah. if you check later on you could have watched the replay okay. so guys there's so much going on technically behind the scenes here even mm -hmm. i don't know what i'm doing half the time <laughs> Cindy Sorry. Says happy father's day so. yes everybody have a wonderful weekend and a happy father's day watch out for the heat yes Take it easy, yes. Anything that you think it, you know, absolutely needs done out there, it can wait. There's no real such thing as a yard or lawn emergency. <laughs> Not at your own um, health's expense. So. Well, there is when my vegetable garden is all wilting, but all I gotta do is turn, go out there and turn the sprinklers on, so. Yes, you're targeted sprinklers just for your vegetables. Yes, my garden. small PVC system just in the vegetable yes. garden. Yes. I'm not wasting water on the lawn. Maybe you can <laughs> on its own. <laughs> and it does. It does. It needs to be cut again. So my lawn's my lawn's fine. Ours just really needs to be cut about the septic tank. That's the only place it needs right now. So Yeah. Oh, and Bill and I are going to do that. Um experiment we talked about the last time we were together we have a, a date on tuesday morning eight o'clock in the morning just so you know because lily doesn't do that <laughs> you know being out in the heat when she doesn't have to um we have someone who volunteered who has a nearly brand new home within six months so we are going to go get a soil test from her home and then we're going to do a soil test on my home, which is 15 years old, but has fill dirt. I told him I'm, I still dig up. Every time I dig anything, I'm digging up concrete chunks, other building pieces. And then the lot that we just purchased next to us has never been built on, never dealt with uh, fill dirt. So that's native soil. So we're going to compare those three soil um, analyses to see if anything is different yeah we'll see what we find and we'll share it with all of you to kind of compare and contrast between new home construction older and um uh, unimproved property mm -hmm. native sand <laughs> compared to fill dirt sand <laughs> so. okay well hey everybody thank you so much and uh thank you so much for putting up with our on and off internet here thankfully lily's was working through the entire thing yes that's a good thing yes okay we will see everybody back here again next thursday at 10 a.m hopefully everything yes. will be working well enough for you to be able to join us and ask questions and join in or otherwise we'll just you know make it up like we did today <laughs> so. we'll wing it we'll make it up as we go along <laughs> Okay, thanks again, everybody. Thanks, Lily. Thank you. Have a good week.